Hey guys, there's a brother in Christ who has a website called ithasbeenwritten.com. Ithasbeenwritten.com is a fountain of information for the believer and unbeliever alike. Link is in the description box and in my pinned comment below. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. It's the deadliest nature disaster in the nation's history. Bird flu is spreading across Israel, devastating flocks both domestic and wild. This is the worst blow to wildlife in Israel ever. There are thousands of cranes which already died, and we still don't know the spread amongst other wildlife or water sources. This is a contagious disease which hurts humans too. But it, it, I built this place with my bare hands for 40 years. Everything is destroyed, absolutely destroyed. I have no livelihood, I have nothing. More than 5,000 dead wild cranes and pelicans have been counted in northern Israel's Hula Lake Reserve, a major stopping point along the birds' migration route from Europe to Africa, which sees the passage of hundreds of thousands of birds annually. There are 20,000 pelicans missing. And no one really knows where they are. The cranes are now being hit. 20% of the population of the cranes in Israel has been hit and killed by the bird flu. How can we help? Yesterday, the corpses of the dead cranes were removed to prevent further infection. But as for concrete steps, no one has a real solution and everybody's waiting and hoping that this death cycle will stop because every day we find more cases of cranes killed by the bird flu. In farming communities in northern Israel, more than half a million chickens and turkeys have been culled as the virus spreads rapidly. The whole village makes a living from these coops. Each has 2,500 birds. This is what we live from. That's what we have. They have cleared all the coops, not even one chicken left. This is an unprecedented situation. The veterinary service at Israel's Ministry of Agriculture has declared a state of emergency, admonishing farmers for not reporting outbreaks sooner, allowing the virus to spread. The country is expected to experience a shortage of 14 million eggs per month for the near future. The government moving to increase egg imports in an effort to head off the shortage. We heard about the shortage of eggs. Of course, we brought in more goods. We also heard from customers who are coming in to buy more eggs. We also talked to the suppliers and were told that the shortage of eggs has already started. Consumers are advised to check for a seal of inspection and to cook all poultry products thoroughly. Meanwhile, nature reserves are closed to visitors to limit contact with humans and prevent further spread. The fear is that it will infect more birds that are in danger of being extinct. We're at the height of the worst ecological disaster in Israel. It's a disaster of global proportions. We can still not evaluate the future implications of this giant ecological disaster, the bird flu. The virus has been documented in more than 40 different countries since July. Meanwhile, here in Israel, it's a race against time for damage control and to stop the spread. Hosea 4, 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. God is judging the world in these last days the same way he judged Israel in Hosea 4.3. The prophet Hosea tells us the reasons God judged Israel. No faithfulness or steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land, swearing, bearing false witness, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, 
apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Once again, President Biden and Vladimir Putin are trying to pull back from the brink of war in Ukraine. U.S. officials say this call is at Putin's request. They wouldn't speculate why, but added if Putin wants to talk, President Biden is ready to engage and that the U.S. goal is de-escalation. With muddy trenches stretching for miles and fields of landmines, Ukraine's border with Russia is this morning perhaps the most volatile flashpoint in the world. A military escalation here could trigger the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. It's an uneven tale of the tape. On one side are U.S. allied Ukrainian troops. They're motivated and battle tested from years of fighting against Russian backed separatists. The Ukrainian troops are armed with American tank killing javelin missiles, including dozens recently supplied by Washington. But when we visited the front a few weeks ago, Ukrainian soldiers told us they couldn't withstand a full Russian onslaught for long. Hope for the best and get ready for the worst. On the other side of this dangerous border stands the full might of Russia's powerful army. Despite Russian reports of a partial pullback from the border region, U.S. officials say a significant force remains in position. Presidents Biden and Putin have already spoken twice about the crisis in person in Geneva this summer, and again by video call just three weeks ago. President Biden has said U.S. troops wouldn't fight Russia directly, but the U.S. and Europe have come up with a battery of new sanctions they claim will cripple Russia's economy if it moves further against Ukraine. Putin's goal from the call is unclear. Yesterday, he was playing hockey with the president of Belarus. The Russian leader is in the process of strengthening a political union with Belarus, and he may also want to add Ukraine to Russia's expanding domains. Luke 21:25, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Fires burn in the hilltop town of Tantalang in Chin State, northwestern Myanmar. The destruction caused by artillery shells and fires set by Myanmar's military appear part of a concerted policy of scorched earth. Most of the town's 10,000 residents have fled across the nearby border into India, powerless to do anything to save their homes. Others fled Chin State for the simple reason they couldn't find anything to eat. Satellite photos show how, starting in September, systematic and coordinated attacks destroyed 580 buildings in the town. These are tactics often associated with Myanmar's military, and all because the residents had shown resistance to February's military coup. Even in the Burman heartland, home of Myanmar's majority ethnic group, opposition has been brutally put down. In Sagang, this woman shrieks with grief after finding the body of her grandfather, one of 12 villagers reportedly murdered by the military. Myanmar's government of politicians in exile condemned the alleged war crimes. And as recently as Christmas Eve, 38 civilians killed and burned. Two workers for the charity Save the Children, now confirmed to be amongst the charred remains. In the past month alone, there have been credible stories of Myanmar's military perpetrating massacres in Sagang district and Kaya state. And in the past week, thousands of civilians have poured into Thailand, telling stories of airstrikes that have targeted civilians. Nearly a year after the military coup, it appears that all the fears about an unchecked military rule inside Myanmar are coming to fruition. <laughs> Protesters on the streets of Sudan's capital, Khartoum, have been demanding an end to military rule. We have demands that include ending military rule and a civilian government with competent capabilities. 
That's why we're out on the streets. A transitional government was formed after protests ended the 30-year rule of Omar al-Bashir in April 2019. But in October, Sudan's army overthrew that transitional government, dashing demonstrators' hopes of democracy. In the conflict in neighboring Ethiopia, all sides have been accused of mass rapes and killings of civilians. Both government troops and rebels have made gains in recent months and then lost them again. The situation's different now. You can no longer pay for the education of your children. You can't buy food because a loaf of bread is now £40. If a family member falls sick, you can't pay for their treatment. People have drained their savings. Life's become absolutely untenable. Many Sudanese share the same view, that the crisis is a direct result of political chaos and the lack of proper government. There has been an explosion in prices, soaring inflation and a huge rise in unemployment, leaving many people in a state of desperation. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat, as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Another night of violence in what's become, in recent days, the most frequent point of friction in the occupied West Bank. Israeli troops sealed off the village of Burqa. Villagers threw rocks and burned tires. The military said shots were fired in the area. Soldiers fired live ammunition, rubber-coated steel bullets and tear gas into the crowd. Iran gave a show of force with its Great Prophet 17 military drill. The Revolutionary Guard and naval forces trained with missiles and drones in the country's south. Tehran says their military was training for an air defense mission, infiltration and special operations, as well as combat operations in biological weapons tainted areas. Though it's unclear what biological weapons threats Iran expects to face from its current rivals. The Great Prophet exercise came just days after Iran said they conducted air defense training in the skies above their nuclear weapons facilities. The show of force comes about as Israeli military and political leaders have stressed that military options are still on the table to destroy or at least delay Iran's nuclear ambitions. Russia is also preparing for military actions themselves, this time test firing a cruise missile in the Sea of Japan. The caliber class cruise missile was fired from a submarine at a target more than 600 miles away in Russian territory. The exercise also included covert movements and support from other naval units, military aircraft and drones. The Sea of Japan has been a bit of a sticking point between Russia and Japan since the Soviet Union seized the Kuril Islands at the end of World War II, and Japan still lays claim to the territory. This has prevented a formal priest treaty from ever being signed between the nations. Taiwan is also training, but for a Chinese invasion. Taiwanese tanks and soldiers open fire at simulated Chinese invaders in a beach landing exercise, showing off combined arms on the nation's southern coast. The operations involved air and missile strikes on the beaches. The drill was meant to showcase the island's defensive capabilities. But China was not impressed. A spokesperson for the Communist Party said that attempting to maintain Taiwan's independence by force was suicide. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8.
So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100 pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. The deadly shooting spree in the Denver area. At least five people killed, three others injured, including a police officer. The violence unfolding across seven different crime scenes, ending in a busy shopping area where the suspect was killed in an exchange of gunfire with police. Tonight, FBI agents and local police are pouring over at least seven different crime scenes. The deadly gun battle playing out across Denver, spilling into a busy shopping mall. This is the holiday season. Uh, to, to have this type of spree take place is not normal for our community. Sources confirming to ABC News the spree started at a tattoo parlor just after 5 p.m. with the intended victim an acquaintance of the shooter, according to law enforcement. He survived, but two women inside were killed, including Alicia Cardenas, who leaves behind a 12-year-old daughter. The suspect, sources tell ABC News, is Lyndon James McLeod, and law enforcement was aware he harbored extremist views and had a history of mental episodes. Police say before exchanging gunfire with officers, McLeod killed another man a few blocks away from the tattoo parlor, then fled to the Denver suburb of Lakewood, targeting a shopping mall. Inside, families hiding to stay alive. We were just in there, uh, my husband and I, and they just, um, you could hear just the popping outside. Um, and it was like one shot and then maybe five or six more and a couple more after that. Police say the suspect escaping to this nearby Hyatt Hotel, shooting a clerk and a Lakewood police officer before being shot and killed. It's a tough day um, for the Lakewood police family. Um, obviously, when this happens to one of our own. Agents are now scouring the writings of this suspect, both physical and online, to try and figure out what led up to the shooting spree. Police have confirmed that he did know all of the Denver victims, and we also have been able to confirm that the second shooting location was actually a tattoo parlor, once owned by the suspect as far back as 2017. In total, there were five shooting victims, six dead overall, with the shooter in mind. The Apostle Paul, in his epistle to Timothy, tells us in the last days, society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. To that father of three, gunned down in a suspected road rage incident in Maryland on Christmas Eve, right in front of his children and girlfriend. 
This morning, authorities in Maryland are asking for the public's help with their investigation into the killing of a professional boxer who was gunned down in a possible road rage incident while driving with his family. In the area of Branch Avenue and St. Bartis Road, drive by shooting. Police in Prince George's County say professional heavyweight boxer Danny Kelly Jr. was killed in front of his girlfriend and their three young children on Christmas Eve. Every time I close my eyes, it just replay in my head. I don't want to close my eyes because I don't want to think about it. Glenise Kennard says they had been out shopping. Kelly was behind the wheel of their SUV on a busy road when she says they spotted an erratic driver. Crossing lanes the whole time. Him and Danny pulled up beside each other. You know, Danny, like, I have children in the car. Kennard says it happened fast, a quick exchange of words before someone in the other vehicle pulled a gun. Danny just said, you know, you need to slow down. You know, I have children in the back seat. And then he just started shooting through the windows. I just automatically just turned around, you know, checked them, make sure they was okay. And then when I turned around, my kids is like, Daddy. Kennard and the kids were not hurt. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, road rage incidents are up from last year. AAA says in a road rage study, 57 million drivers reported switching lanes quickly or very close behind another vehicle. 71 million drivers admit to making rude gestures or honking at another driver. Kelly's longtime boxing coach and mentor has this message for the gunman. I don't know if you realize what you have done. He took a great part of the community and he took a great part of me and his family, his kids, from his kids. He took a lot. Police now offering a $25,000 reward in the shooting that killed the boxer known for his skills inside the ring and his love for family outside the ring. He was just everything, just everything. He's the best day anybody can ask for. Turning now to a shooter at large in Texas. Tonight, police have named 14-year-old Abel Elias Acosta as the shooter in a triple homicide over the weekend. Tonight, police searching for 14-year-old Abel Elias Acosta, who they say is the shooter in this shocking video. Garland PD says the teen is responsible for killing three other teens and injuring a fourth after firing more than 20 rounds into a convenience store in Garland, Texas. The victims killed in the Sunday night shooting identified as 14-year-old Xavier Gonzalez, 16-year-old Ivan Noyala, and 17-year-old Rafael Garcia. The triple homicide leaving the community in heartache. He came just to get food and never came back home. And, you know, we just want justice for him. He was a good kid. Friends and family looking for answers. And all we ask is for everyone to speak up. You know, as a community, so we can get justice for all three of them. Garland police released the name of the alleged killer this afternoon, saying, quote, it is typically not the practice of the Garland Police Department to release juvenile information, but due to the nature of the offense and potential risk to the public, the court has authorized the release of his information. We're asking for anyone who has information on his whereabouts to call 911 immediately. We believe him to be armed and dangerous. Abel is facing a capital murder charge. On Monday, police took another 14-year-old into custody, but released him. Authorities say that 14-year-old remains a person of interest. The knowledge that this 14-year-old has given us leads us to believe that he has intimate information about the shooting. He has been released and he is not the shooter. All this comes after 33-year-old Richard Acosta, who police say is the father of the alleged shooter and driver of the getaway car, turned himself in earlier this week. Police are charging him with capital murder of multiple people. One of the many signs that we're living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, 
and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. Weather reported tornadoes in the south and more snow pummeling parts of the west. Rob Marciano joins us with more on that. And Rob, millions will be on alert for that extreme weather through New Year's Day. Yeah, it's a bad combination. We've got all that energy from the storms in the west bumping into record-breaking heat in the southeast, and that's what's causing this severe weather. And we had a number of tornadoes yesterday. Look at this damage out of uh, Winfield, Alabama, one of uh, three reported tornadoes doing severe damage there. There actually were eight people that were trapped inside a pizza restaurant uh, that collapsed on them, but they're okay. Scary stuff for sure, and they've got a lot to rebuild. Rescuers continues to work around the clock Monday, trying to reach residents still trapped across the northeastern state of Bahia. 72 towns and cities have been flooded by torrential rains that intensified over the Christmas holiday when two dams collapsed. In the city of Itabuna, some residents returned to their homes to pick up their belongings through a second floor window. Emergency workers rescued hundreds in nearby towns, but heavy currents on the swollen rivers continue to complicate the operations. The governor of the state of Bahia declared it the worst disaster in the state's history. Half a million have been affected, at least 16,000 are homeless. Authorities are also monitoring an additional 10 dams for any danger signs and say they will regulate the release of water to avoid flash floods. Many have been surprised by the severity of the rain. Authorities blame an increase in the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean mixed with the Niña weather phenomenon for pushing rain patterns north. Some experts say it's a sign of climate change. The forecast calls for more rain, but even when that stops, it will take many weeks, if not months, to recover from the devastation. Does Satan have the power to control the weather? The increasing number of natural disasters and terrible storms have many people wondering who controls the weather, God or Satan. Some point to the descriptions of Satan as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2 and the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4 as evidence for Satan having control over the weather. An examination of scripture reveals that whatever influence Satan has over the weather is restricted by God's ultimate sovereignty. The devil, our adversary, must be taken seriously. We should acknowledge his existence and his limited power over the secular world. At the same time, Satan, a defeated fallen angel, is very powerful but not divine, having only the power that God ultimately allows. If Satan could impact the weather, it would only be by God's permission and restrained, as in the case of Job. Satan was allowed by God to torment Job in order to test him and this included the fire of God, probably lightning, which fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, as we read in Job 1.16. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. This was followed by a mighty wind, possibly a tornado, that destroyed his eldest son's home and killed Job's children, as we read in verses 18 and 19. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So if the fire from heaven and the tornado were somehow caused by Satan, they were still under the ultimate control of God for his purposes. It is God, not Satan, who controls the weather. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. God is in control of all things, including the weather. Through his providence, God provides for and protects his children. But he also permits Satan, demons, and mankind to exercise their limited will to commit acts of sin, evil, and wickedness. 
We may not always know why evil acts or natural disasters happen, but we can be assured that God is working all things together for his purpose and for our good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Typhoon Rai packed winds of more than 200 kilometers an hour and made landfall nine times last week from the east to the far west of the Philippines' central and southern islands. Millions of people are having to pick up whatever's left of their lives. The devastation is unprecedented. State weather forecasters had predicted a powerful typhoon, but when it hit the country, it exceeded their expectations. Typhoon Rai also hit about a third of the country that has historically been spared the fiercest storms. It also sustained its strength throughout. Rai is not the first supercyclone to devastate the Philippines. In 2013, Super Typhoon Haiyan left a trail of destruction and killed at least 6,000 people. It was one of the strongest typhoons ever recorded. Many scientists and environmentalists say such extreme weather in the Philippines is a consequence of climate change. And they're afraid it's only going to get worse. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather. And yet, it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. 
No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself. As we read in John 6:44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian, but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh as we read in Galatians 519 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12.13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep.
God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready!